Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. In today's episode, we're speaking with Brandon Pitcher, founder of Blue Circle Farms, which is a full-service solutions-based company specializing in agricultural hemp production and processes. Brandon is an award-winning change agent and educator, having gained an understanding of social and ecological entrepreneurship nearly two decades ago. Since 2003, Brandon has been a Ziri, Zero Emissions Research and Initiatives Certified Practitioner and Promoter of Blue and Circular Economies. Join us today as we chat with Brandon about social entrepreneurship, sustainability, hemp, CBD, and mushrooms. Welcome, Brandon. Good morning. How are you, buddy? Good. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate uh, being here today. <laughs> I'm a little tired after that intro. You, yeah. You've got a lot going on. I I, uh, I really, really appreciate your time today. I know you're super, super busy. And speaking of which, where where in the world are you today? Uh, currently out near uh, Shelton, Washington, at a lake house. Um, we have a, a mushroom farm out here that we work with. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm spending my time on right now. Now, is that eastern or western Washington? Uh, I guess it'd be to the west of Olympia. So, oh, okay. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. I'm, I'm a University of Oregon product, so I'm somewhat familiar with the uh, with the Northwest, and I love that's kind of that's mushroom climate and territory, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. grow over here, grow naturally everywhere here. So it's uh, it's a great location, and, and we got lucky and found a business to acquire here. It was a five year old shiitake operation, certified organic mushroom farm. Um, and we just thought it was a wise idea to, at the time to, to be a part of it out here and network with, uh, uh, the, I guess, the, the experts in the community of the mushroom enthusiasts in, in this part of the country. As the industry is, is about to explode across the nation, um, you want to surround yourself with, with people that are, that are good at what they do. When it comes to, um, way off topic here, but I could remember, you know, 100 years ago, I went to culinary school in the Northwest as well. And we had a few instructors, one in particular, who, um, you know, was real big into tr to truffle hunting, yep. truffle exploring and mushrooms. And he used to do these old fashioned slideshows, right? I, again, 100 years ago, right? And uh, he would like just show like the tips and tops of a of a forest and say, yes, this is the area where I located my my trouble and, and you had no idea where he was right you saw a blue sky and the tips of some some evergreens so it's kind of a a little bit of a secretive thing isn't it the whole truffle piece well especially on, yeah when you talk about some of the higher value and, and outdoor harvested crops you know people do protect their territories you know yeah yeah in the season and that's a there's a lot of people out hunting those and, and, and a lot of competition now because more and more people are, are getting into the hunting but, um, you know, where I come from, you know, there's been people been using the same kind of patches and areas for, for, for decades. For decades. Yeah, 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 and yeah. They are, and they don't really tell you either. <laughs> they got to like you to let you know, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, well, we'll get a little bit more into the mushrooms here in a bit, but I, I'd love to kind of set the stage. This is, for me, again, thank you. Super fascinating topics. Um You've been in the R&D sector for some time now, specifically in this space of sustainability, renewable energy, um, and then of late, and uh, you know, more or less pioneering the way forward uh, for the professional cannabis industry. So, again, we'll we'll discuss discuss this topic um, um, again shortly. But I'd love for you to speak, if you could, in general. I'm just making some assumptions here for the general public about blue circular economies. And I, I, you know, we're referring to sustainability for economic growth and improve uh, livelihoods, jobs, mm -hmm. while we're preserving the health of our ecosystem, right? Do I have that right? Or? It's, yes, yes. Uh, uh, it's a lot of words, you know, but, but it, it, it is accomplished, uh, you know, is, is a way to still have industrial civilization and societies uh, maybe even go beyond that, um, but do it in a way that, that co-evolves with nature um, and, and in a way that, that takes into consideration, you know, ecosystem services, uh, the true value of nature and the true value of biodiversity 
um, and, and, and having a way of designing and living with it instead of uh, destroying it in our process for, or in our, in our search for prosperity. You know, um, we, we, we need to rethink and redesign almost all processes of production um, on earth to, to meet these goals and challenges uh, of sustainability and to build a circular economy. Uh, the blue economy is, is, you know, as you know, as we've learned, or as I've been sharing, is something my mentor named Gunther Pauli kind of came up with, and, and it was a good book, but it's really about hundreds of innovations around the world and entrepreneurial projects that we believe can change the world and, and, and help lead to this, uh, this new economic model. And it's not just about talk. You know, there's, I mean, I went to hundreds of lectures when I was younger around the world into 50 countries, you know, studying projects and, uh, you know, researching different, different aspects. And then it was, so it was more important to me to see real projects than it was to see, you know, uh, pictures of the projects, um, to know that it could be done. Um, and there was actually hope out there and, and there was uh, reasons to, 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 to search for uh, opportunities to do projects. And then that's what gets me into things like cannabis and then into mushrooms. You know, um, you know, because one one of the things um, that that well, currently right now, cannabis is probably one of the most environmentally, you know, atrocious plants on the planet. Uh, the way that we're producing it, um, but it also has one of the, the biggest areas of hope for for humanity as well as in the industrial applications of the plants, uh, more than just the recreational aspects. You know, so so that's what kind of led me into wanting to get more and more in, into that as it became legal. Um, but but that's a, a very long term endeavors. You know, to get people to start you know industrial systems to really change. We're starting to see that now that that legalization has happened. You're seeing you know uh, toilet paper manufacturers popping up. You're seeing plastics manufacturers, different things that are starting to utilize the plants, which is um, important um, and is going to be just more and more as time goes on and the infrastructure is developed. Now it's more about building infrastructure for that for that business than anything. Sure, sure. That's that's helpful. Have yeah. you found, Brandon, in the in, in in recent years, you've been involved in this space for many years, decades. Um, have you found the momentum and support, uh, the evangelistic part of it increasing in 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 recent years, given all of the concerns about um, in not only the economy, but the the world as we know it. Yeah, you're seeing, you know, it, it seems to be, it goes up and down depending on where you're at and which, which part of the world you're in, um, in which country. But mm -hmm. here in the United States, um, really with this new administration and, and with this new round of, uh, you know, infrastructure funding and a lot of things that are coming down, you're hearing a lot more talk from communities, uh, community leaders, you know, city leaders, um, people who are who have this you know, the resources trying to, to, to do something, you know, cities like Chicago um, are, are really getting aggressive on like uh, urban farming. You know, bringing in uh, mushrooms and other alternative crops to to help redevelop some, uh, certain parts of the South Side. You know, and you're seeing a lot of um, you know you know new people are open now to new ideas more than they ever have been. Um, and, and so now is the best time for entrepreneurs and, and people in my lifetime to implement projects and to go out and get projects and to get funding for projects um, because the demand is there. and People are really realizing the problem. 20 years ago when we started and I started lecturing on sustainability, a lot of people laughed at me. A lot of people didn't even know what the word sustainability was. You know, and now it's a catchphrase and almost all industries using it. And now we're talking about you know, our carbon footprint and all these things. Once we really realize how to do it and solve the problems, which there is a framework out there that, that Ziri really helped provide for me um, and Gunter Pauli and his work um, for, for us to, to move forward with, with this in, in very large scale endeavors and not have to sacrifice our quality of life in the process. But if we don't make the changes, we're gonna sacrifice our quality of life, we're gonna sacrifice our standard of living and potentially sacrifice our ability to survive on earth. Uh, and so we have well, to well, well said, super helpful. And, and I can't help but think as you're, as you're sharing the correlation to the food industry and everything that we're, we're doing to prepare the next generation of, of cooks and chefs and pastry chefs and such, um, sustainability, food waste, um, local practices have become 
you know, just commonplace in our curriculum. So uh, the, the correlation is, is real, uh, intentional and very, very important. You know, I, on a more personal level, um, can you speak a little bit of the goal, the overall goal of Blue Circle Development and Farms? Yeah. I mean, when we started, it was really um, as a way to help, um, you know, get, you know, spread the ideas, you know, um, and, and, and go beyond just the education. Because like I said, I've given like five, six hundred lectures and really thinking I had to educate people to, to build a market or build an audience or to build, you know, uh, get people to understand what we were trying to accomplish. Um, and then we can move towards real projects, you know. And so I think that the time now is towards implementation. You know, for, for me, this really is, a, you know, last decade was a, was what the UN called the decade towards education for sustainable development. Well, now should be the decade for implementation of sustainable development. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to get to work. You know? um, and so I thought, you know, I was just kind of following those trends. Um, and it makes sense. So for us, it was a way to, you know, my goal with the companies and with them is the is to expose people to the five kingdoms and the opportunities to solve our problems through there. And from what I've learned, you know, traveling the world and studying under some of the, the world's best leaders in sustainability, people like Luther Pauli and Fred Job Capra and Janine Venus and Amory Levins. And I mean, there's, you know, there's names like I couldn't there's a list of them, I couldn't name them all. Um, but, you know, so but learning from all these people and, and understanding different perspectives uh, from the globe what's happening in the challenges ahead, you know, we have solutions. And so we need, we need to be able to expose them to people. So so similar to, to this, this is a platform or a way for us to do that. So um, we got into the hemp industry. Um, we got into some of the first organic hemp farms, you know, back then, and then we helped try to spread that. And then the hemp industry kind of had its ups and downs, as everybody knows. Sure, sure. But yeah. We took some, some challenges in there. You know, we, we had some of the first, uh, um, issues when it comes to the hemp uh, being confiscated, you know, and, and different things like that, you know, so there's a lot, a lot of uh, learning um, being done across the country, you know, and so we were, we were glad to be a part of all that, um, you know, uh, but currently, you know, like you said, about, again, everything is about infrastructure, so we need in this country to keep focusing on building the industrial scale infrastructure for what I would say is uh, the solutions we find within the five kingdoms. And so the five kingdoms, you know, are, are, are plants, which is where cannabis comes in, um, which is the most useful plant for the circular economy. Um, and then we have fungus, you know, so right now we're really heavily focused on infrastructure of, of building and supporting uh, the mushroom industry and the fungus industry, not just mushrooms, but uh, substrate production and different things like that. Um, and then we're starting to look into partnership with other companies um, that would utilize mushrooms for different things like construction materials or, or packaging and all that. Um, and then you have algae, you know, uh, or protista, which is another great thing to clean water, to sequester carbon, to generate energy, to produce food. You know, so all these different, you know, kingdoms, you know, bacteria and then animals. Uh, you know, all, all of them provide the solutions that we need to to support all the basic needs of humanity going forward. And, and, we, and we could probably have 10 or 12 billion people on earth if we designed properly and went to, towards a zero waste and a zero and a circular economy model. I mean, if you just look at the numbers, you mentioned food and food waste, uh, calories, you know, we produce more calories now than the world can consume. We just don't spread it equitably, right? Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. some of those calories are wasted before they even get to the dinner plate. Right? We throw it away, they're scraps, they don't look right, it's a, it's a freaky looking carrot or, or, or an ugly potato, so it never makes it to the grocery store. You know? So, so we, we, we've designed our system to be wasteful from the start. That's got to change. Now, I, I appreciate that. I was going to kind of dive into the type of research, but you brought up uh, the five kingdoms, which I know very little about mostly, um, but learning more, mostly because as you know, I sit in Boulder. And we do, we do some fun, some fun things with, with Donna and Greg over at fed. And I was introduced and I have to tell the funny story that sharing with you earlier that, you know, tragically we, we had the Marshall fires right at the end of the year um, here in the Boulder area, uh, superior Louisville, uh, lots of communities were impacted. So the next day, you know, several folks that, you know, um, um, 
got busy, right? We started cooking, we started taking care of people. Um, and I spent the day with my son uh, at the Fed uh, commissary and little, little did I know, because I didn't find out till after because he's so incredibly humble. Um, I was sitting there next to, you know, this hippie with these, uh, um, you know, strangely large hands, right? And it turned out to be former NFL player, you know, Jake Plummer, who's very, very involved in the mushroom business uh, here in Colorado. But would you mind, um, I know that we've had one uh, Five Kingdoms dinner uh, probably a month ago now, and some of our Escoffier students were able to uh, participate and help out. Can you, uh, this is a great opportunity for a plug, right? Um, there's several more uh, Five Kingdom dinners planned, right? Around the country, yeah, there are. We, we we have maybe even up to up to ten is still going on later this year. Wow! Uh, wow! You know, we, we 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 have a few in the different states, right? But Colorado is kind of where the hub is, I believe. This year we're shooting for I think eight or nine in Colorado this year. We have one uh, about 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 a month ago now in uh, yeah. Long. Um, yeah. Did really well. I think about a hundred people showed up. Uh, that's all I could hold. Um, and and, and uh, Jake, as you mentioned, Jake Plummer, he was there. He was one of the speakers talking about his mushroom business. Yeah. And uh, it was a blast. We had, uh, you know, one of the musicians from, uh, I think Jeff uh, Frank is his name, from Thievery Corporation. And we had some dancers. It was, it was a blast. And then we had Fed, of course, there doing the Five Kingdoms dinner. <coughs> Your students helping out. And so in this case, you know, this is the year of the mushrooms. So uh, we've been hosting these Five Kingdoms dinners for a while now, um, and it's a methodology that, that, that I created basically in response to going to all these sustainability conferences and things, and then they're just feeding us whatever junk food they normally had. At <laughs> Ironically, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So none of, we were talking about all this stuff, but none of it was living it, you know, and it was, that, that kind of bothered me. So I, I started hosting my own events, and so I started working with chefs and um, coming up with ideas of how to educate around what I was talking about, you know, while you were eating. And uh, the five kingdoms became the, the, one of the smart approaches to do that. So in this case, uh, we, we, you know, Donna would, would come up with, or the, or the chefs that we work with, will come up with, uh, they'll have uh, at least five species of mushrooms, uh, five varieties, and then we would have um, um, uh, five courses minimum, uh, but they would be paired with uh, the five kingdoms of nature. So you would have to pair the, the mushroom with a, a bacteria, a mushroom with a plant, a mushroom with an animal, a mushroom with an algae, a mushroom with another mushroom or another fungus, right? So you, you, you have to be creative. And, but in this case, we really like people to do a, try to be a little more local oriented too and learn to use your ecosystem and eat your ecosystem um, because that's the healthiest way of eating. Uh, biodiversity and it's the, probably the smartest way of keeping our ecosystem thriving and alive is to make them useful for us and productive for us so we don't lose these species um, you know and so we become so it's a lot of fun um, you know we, we do so that it's a, a non-threatening way uh, to experience something new and educational um, and potentially a, a future form of, of eating um, I mean, if we, if we were looking at, if we're going to colonize space or Mars or wherever, you know, we're probably going to use something like the Five Kingdoms diet um, more than we are a vegan diet or, or a carnivore only diet. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love the education piece about it. And, um, you know, like I've let Donna and Greg know, please, please keep Escoffier uh, involved. Uh, you know, a lot of fun. And I'm really glad to, to hear that there'll be more uh, in our, in our area. Now this next time I'll say hi to that hippie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, come May, May 21st, um, is the next one in partnership with slow food Alliance. Um, so your students hopefully will be there. I believe Donna's talking with them already, but they should be there. That's beautiful. Uh, That's great. That's great. Let, let's, uh, let's shift a little bit to, um, and, and, and I, arguably I'm not, I'm not an expert, but the cannabis industry, as, as we know it today is nothing, like the one of old, I'll say, right? Today, um, gosh, and obviously here in Colorado, maybe most states, marijuana has been legalized, at least for the medicinal purposes, right? I believe um, a handful of states, seven seven or eight states have legalized uh, CBD oil only. Yeah. And, and Brandon, you've been, you've been researching hemp and, 
and developing products in support of cannabis, uh, the cannabis industry for many, many years. So for, for our listeners, our students and others, can you provide sort of a high level narrative on the difference, the specific difference between hemp and cannabis? What do you mean you say you're interested in marijuana and and and, and yeah and yeah it's all cannabis right it's so, all cannabis so, yeah so I mean scientifically it's all cannabis sativa right uh, and so so we, we 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 you know one of them just has low THC and has the different attributes and grows differently has more you know um, more nutrition in the seed or more strength in the fiber you know um, so depending on what we're growing for and what the genetics are for and and currently what you guys have in Colorado you know you know mostly of, of is marijuana and, and more of the CBD industry so it's all grown more like marijuana okay. uh, majority of it you know uh, but that's changing really rapidly you know Colorado wants to be the, the leader of, of the industrial side of it as well it's just not so well suited for it environmentally, you know, and 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 and, and culturally. But I think it's going that it, it has a lot of potential. Um, but but once you know hemp is legal again all over the world, you know, there'll be probably other places that pop up as the as the, the best places to farm this. You know, the, the logistics of, of a fiber crop or your grain crops and those those places will take over those markets over time. Um, and that's just, but again, it's an infrastructure issue currently for us. Um, and that's where we're at uh, when it comes to the, the industrial side, you know, trying to get like a t shirt, you know, made here. Sure. Yeah. Um, that's more difficult than it is to, to get a joint made. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. What, what, are, what are some of the uh, critical shifts in the industry that you've witnessed that? again, personal question, that continue to motivate you to continue to do the work that you do in this industry? Well, I guess, you know, since actually with the Five Kingdoms approach, you know, and, and even some of the cannabis and hemp stuff and, and the mushroom side of it, I've been doing for uh, 20 years now. You yeah, know? yeah. So, I mean, I, 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 maybe even longer, some of it, you know, but, but I've, I've got Ziri certified and Ziri Zero Mission Research trained in my early 20s and, and, and that's really what it got me motivated to say this is what i'm going to do for the rest of my life you know and I, i've just done that you know i just said it when i was 19 or 20 that when i first learned the term sustainable development from a, again i saw a man named william mcdonough and uh he gave a speech in in san francisco at a conference i was at and and he, he talked it was called cradle to cradle and then he can end up writing a book about that but he was the first american to really put what I was feeling inside into, I think, a terminology and a framework that I could understand academically or theoretically. Mm -hmm. And then I, that's where and I looked at my dad and I was like, this is what I'm going to do, you know, and, and I just never, never turned back, you know, and I, so I, 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 so I don't know that, that if there's something, um, if it's just something I've always had internally, if it's something, you know, that you have to have that kind of drive for something like that and a purpose. Yeah, that's where yeah. I'm kind of lucky to find it young, you know, because um, like I said, I've given over five, 600 lectures on the subjects, um, you know, in 30 countries, 40 countries. Um, um, so I just kept going and going. And, and, and now I'm, I've shifted. I don't do the education as much. I've turned it more into these dinners, a little more private and, you know, and, and smaller groups. And, and, and I don't do as many public lectures and stuff like that. I might get back into that again, but I think now I'm more focused again on implementation and, and networking with people who can help me implement what our, what our goals are. I love, I love that story. I, I mean, every, all of us need at times a mentor or an inspiration to sort of validate. I love how you, how you refer to what you were feeling inside and then this individual who you've never met before was able to articulate it for you. And, 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 I, and our students tell us stories of this all the time, right? It might, be a, it might be a technique that they've never seen before. It could be a grandmother, you know, who had a special way of cooking that, uh, that really impressed or, or, or inspired them. Um, I, I, I love that story. T talk to me about the, or talk to us, I should say, about the journey that hemp or cannabis has made into the wellness space. I, I, I can speak, you know, from personal experience that, you know, that the pain that both of my parents have experienced dealing with cancer 
you know, over time has been eased um, by some of the topical, you know, canna- cannabis products that they use, even as simple as a, you know, a hemp muscle and joint balm or something like that. But, it, you, you know, can you speak a little bit to this journey that this became mainstream? Well, I mean, I can, I mean, I can, I can, from my own perspective, I can talk about it a little bit and I can talk about, it, I guess, from a maybe national perspective, you know, or historical perspective. I mean, it, it's, 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 we, we, have people who have used the product have always known its benefits, right? And sure, we've, sure. We've been misled and maybe lied to by our own government, you know, for up to a hundred years, you know, uh, and, and that's, that's the only problem. That's the only real issue why it's not the number one wellness product today. Mm-hmm. I mean, back a hundred years ago, maybe 120 years ago, when you went to a pharmacy in this country, uh, over half the products had cannabis in them, right? And then, and then all of a sudden, they tell you it's not medicinal. <laughs> and so that, that makes no sense. You yeah, know, yeah. even our biggest companies, Eli Lilly, had uh, one of the largest marijuana farms in the world up until 1920, and it was in Indiana, a little a place called Connor Prairie. You know, and I mean, they were using it. They had a, they had their own strain name, you know, cannabis Americana. You know, and then but then they hide all that information after it becomes illegal and try to say they didn't, they never did it. I mean, they 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 they, try to, they, they lied to us for hundred years. I guess that's the problem with it. We so now that that we have it legal again, we can use it, right? We're starting to put it, but they still haven't given us clearance to use the, like CBD and topicals and you're missing these things and they're working for people and we still don't have federal clearance to do these things. Yeah, yeah. So it makes no sense. So I don't, I don't know what the, their agenda is. So I, I can't really speak to that, you know, because I, I'm not, I don't, I don't sit in those rooms, you know, with them. Yeah. You know? Um, but whenever they made it illegal, they had reasons for that, you know. And 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 the, and and I do know this: it, it was easier to grow marijuana in this country for many years than it was to grow hemp. Mm-hmm. Right? And hemp does not get you high. So if, if 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 getting high was what they were really afraid of, I don't think that was the truth. <laughs> kind of backwards, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, let let me let me segue a, a little bit. I, I appreciate your transparency and and honesty. It's it's so clear, Brendan, that that the notion of sustainability is incredibly important to you and has been for a long time. You served as the chief sustainability officer for Fortune Management. For, for over 20 years, um, you, you know, from a purely academic perspective, because students will listen, what is your definition of sustainability? And, 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 and what is our obligation as a, as a current generation, a new generation to, to set, the, set the foundation for a more sustainable future, whether that's here or in outer space, but what, what's our obligation? Well, I believe we all have an obligation to, because we're alive, right? So we're all part of the system at play, and we can all be a part of the solutions if we want to be. Um, mm-hmm. but, it, but that requires an open mind, it requires, uh, you, know, uh, you know, educating yourself, it requires, you know, uh, being honest, it requires uh, true freedom, Right, I think sustainability, in my mind, is, is where is where true freedom lies, and it's what we have. We we, we crave it as, as Americans, especially. Uh, but true freedom re- requires accountability and responsibility uh, for everything, which means your environment, your you know your your neighborhood, your community, uh, you know your planet. You know all these things are, are our responsibility to take care of. I think just by being alive, we have some type of obligation to to to, to look for solutions to be a part of. Now we have, live in societies, and we live in a, a business model that kind of goes against almost everything that that we in the sustainability world are trying to go after, right? So we go. Our business model is very extractive. It's very wasteful, um, and so those whole things need to change. Our our ways of living need to change a little bit. And I don't want to put the, the push back on the individual people and say, hey, your individual carbon footprint or ecological footprint is a problem. It's really not the problem. It's the industrial side of it. It's the production, it's the extraction and production 
and how we do handle that. That's mm -hmm. the largest problem that we have. And it's, it's, but we like to push it off on individual consumers so that way they don't to hold the businesses accountable. But it's really, we really need to hold accountability at the production side as much as we do at the, at the, at the individual level. I, I love the, um, and I wrote this down, where true freedom lies, um, yeah. sustainability. That's, it's, it's, it's a great algorithm. Um, you know, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about technology and innovation. And I'm fascinated with farming. And uh, of course, we talk to our, to our students about farming a lot. H how has technology improved the process of, let's, ju let's just say, uh, the farming of hemp? For, for an example, how has technology uh, helped that in recent years? Well, there's, I mean, there's, it all depends on your perspective. I mean, uh, some of the, the best farms I've been to were the most low tech, you know, uh, just kind of. Oh, interesting. Like, okay. Yeah. More natural methods, you know, um, kind of went back to an older way of farming. And then some of the more high tech ways, you know, with uh, the plastic and the drip tape and the, and the drones and the precision, you know, uh, nutrients and all that stuff um, didn't produce as well of a product, you know, so, so I've seen both happen. Um, so I can say technology has its place, um, but I don't think if we are going to rely on the technology to solve our problems, that's not, that's not going to lead to the most sustainable solutions. What, what, what are some of the challenges around that? In, in what regard? In technology and, 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 and applying that to these farming techniques? Uh, well, you know, not, I mean, not, well, a lot of us just getting people to accept change, right? Yeah, okay. That's the hardest part, you know? Sure, sure. And dealing with anybody, it doesn't matter if it's a farmer or an industrial system or a mayor of the city or city hall talking about a wastewater treatment plant, getting them to adopt any kind of change is very difficult and can be slow and cumbersome. Um, but but if you can prove that it works, uh, usually with a neighbor or a friend, uh, then they'll adopt it. You know, so it's you. It's a good book called um, was it the uh, uh, is it the uh, the diffusion of innovations by Everett M. Rogers, and uh, it, it, it gives a lot of great examples about how you know ideas uh, and technologies diffuse, and he really studied um, how. Uh, pesticides in like the 1930s, 40s, and 50s took off. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. them. But, but it's really, really good um, knowledge to win. Even though I'm against pesticides for the most part, uh, you can still learn from everybody. Well, sure, sure, sure. What What's next, uh, if, if you can share any secrets, what's, what's next on the horizon for Brandon? Well, I really want to push these dinners more. Um, people are starting to really uh, attract to them and understand the vision and message. Um, and I want to, I want us working with a group to, to open a network of uh, uh, these, uh, I guess, substrate infrastructure farms for, for mushroom production. Yeah, yeah. Uh, across the nation. Um, and so really, really kind of zeroed in on that right now because um, of my, our experience in the hemp industry and other stuff led us to, to want to be more heavily involved in, in the mushroom side of it before it takes off. And so we want to, you know, where we want to acquire a few different businesses um, and, 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 and um, really be able to help, help, help educate and guide the industry from the ground. Up. What do you spend most of your time? I know you're in Washington currently, but uh, where, where do you spend most of your time? Well, Honestly, Kirk, for the last couple of years, I've, I've, I've just been traveling. I don't know, I mean, just moving around. <laughs> you know, long, I don't really stay anywhere too long. I think the longest I've stayed somewhere is maybe 90 days. Yeah. <laughs> on to the next place. I don't, it, it's, it's somewhat challenging, but I'm single. I don't have any kids, you know, so, and, and I have a message to tell. So I've got to, if I sit at home, I don't really, I don't really, really do much yeah i love i love that it, interesting it reminds me um boy i don't know where the time goes we you, you were here on the campus and it boy it was right before the pandemic right and and then the pandemic hits and you know before you know it a couple of years pass and um and then we got reconnected for the for the five kingdoms and i so 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 glad that we did we're, we're getting towards the end but before i let you go i want to bring it all together 
full circle, uh, pun intended, with uh, with food. So the name of the podcast is The Ultimate Dish. So I think I know what you're going to say, but if I had to ask you, Brandon, yeah. what, what's The Ultimate Dish? What would that uh, be? It, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it would probably have to be, and I have to say, it would be one that includes the five kingdoms, right? There you go. So, there you go. <laughs> I don't have all of them in it. And so I, I've been trying to convince several different groups and people to start, and I'm probably just going to start doing it myself, but from now on, all our products should be, should have some type of resemblance of the five kingdoms included. And that's what I think is going to lead to the healthiest uh, body, healthiest, you know, human, and, and hopefully just to a better relationship to our environment. Absolutely. Well, um, I hope you can stay in touch. Um, I, I need to reach out to Donna today. want to get the agenda uh, May 21st, see if we can be of some assistance with that uh, particular event. I look forward to it. And thanks for all the work you're doing. Super, super educational. And uh, I know we'll be in touch more. So thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thanks again, and thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Auguste Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast, where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe. <laughs>